So this is a really fun chapter. I like this chapter a lot. It has some uh, good stories in it. Story of the Good Samaritan. Very famous parable that Jesus tells. Um, and if you remember last week, we talked about Luke chapter 9. This chapter begins in a very similar way. Jesus is sending out his disciples. Last chapter he sent out 12 disciples. This time he's sending out 72. So he sends out these 72 disciples into surrounding villages, and they return, they come back to Jesus, and they report back to him, and they are amazed at what has happened. They say, Lord, even the demons obey us when we use your name. So they come back, and after this, Jesus teaches his disciples a little um, after they return, and then he has this interaction with this expert in religious law, and that leads into the famous parable of the Good Samaritan. And finally, they, they leave, they continue on where they're going, they stop by in Bethany, um, and we're introduced to Martha and Mary, who are uh, very close friends uh, with Jesus. They are the, their sisters, and they are related to Lazarus, who Jesus la- raises from the dead. So, <clears throat> let's start with uh, the 72 disciples. So Jesus sends out these 72 disciples, and he gives them specific instructions. And it's very similar to Luke chapter 9. Last chapter, he sends out the 12 disciples, and he gives them Almost identical instructions. You know, don't take any money along, don't take a bag, don't take an extra pair of sandals. You know, very, very specific instructions on how they are to go into these villages and preach and heal people. And last week we talked about the reason for that. Why is Jesus being very specific? You know, he's trying to teach his disciples to rely on the gospel radically. You know, depend on it fully. It only works when you rely on it totally. When you depend on it for your success. So, um, a couple of interesting things that I found while I was kind of uh, reading some commentaries and preparing for today. The number 72, 72 disciples, is a very specific number. Um, it has some significance. It's actually a purposeful reference to Genesis chapter 10. In Genesis 10, um, the, the descendants of Noah's three sons are listed. They're listed in Genesis chapter 10, and there's 72 names given. And each of these names represents a nation of people. And this is called the Table of Nations um, in, in Jewish uh, history. So Jesus is aware of that, and he's choosing 72 people for a reason, specifically. You know, he's making a point that his mission is universal. You know, he, last chapter he sent out 12 disciples. This time he's sending out 72. 72, all nations. My message is for all nations, all disciples. He's making a point that everyone is sent. And it's not just clergy who go out and do work for my disciples. Everyone is sent. So that's very interesting to me. And the other interesting aspect, and this is what I want to focus on today, is right in the beginning of the chapter, in verse 3, what Jesus says. Now go and remember that I am sending you out as lambs among wolves. That's a very interesting thing for Jesus to say. He doesn't say that in chapter 9, but he says it here. What does that mean? Why does he say that he's sending you out, us out as lambs among wolves? That's very interesting. What does that tell us about Jesus' message? First of all, I think, you know, there's a couple things that you can learn from this. I think the simplest thing, first thing we can learn from that, is that they can expect difficulty, right? You can't be a lamb among wolves without experiencing some level of difficulty, at least fear, right? And also they're going into a hostile environment, Jesus warns them even they're going to be rejected. He says how they are to respond if they're rejected. Shake, wipe, you know, shake the dust from your feet if the town rejects you. My dad wrote this book, um, Go to the Right Fields First, and he talks at length about this principle of shaking the dust off your feet. You know, um, you know, in missions, you have a choice where you go. You know, where are you going to spread the gospel? And he and makes this point that if you go, you'll experience rejection. You know, Jesus is giving a tool to not let the rejection you know, affect you. Don't Let it become something deep in your heart, a wounding. Shake the dust off your feet. Go on to the next village. You know, he says that if they reject you, they're actually rejecting me. It's not about you. They're rejecting me. So that's comforting. You know, that's how you handle kind of this rejection. That's not all, though. And there's more to this than just going into a hostile environment. He's sending them out among wolves, but he's sending them out as lambs, right? He's sending them out in weakness, in a defenseless state, purposefully, too. He's telling them not to bring anything with them. Don't bring any money. Don't bring an extra pair of sandals. Don't bring a traveling bag. You know, he's sending them out purposefully, weak, and in a defenseless state. That's very interesting. 
You know, he's not sending them out into as like warriors, right, going into battle, preparing them for a war, you know, sending them out in strength. He's sending them out as lambs among wolves. Think about that. He's he's sending them out with nothing to fall back on. He knows they're going to face rejection. He purposefully sends them into danger and basically tells them to not defend themselves. Be a lamb among wolves. Very interesting. I think what Jesus is doing here is explaining to his disciples that in the world you'll be attacked, right? You'll be hated and rejected because of me, you know? Not because of you, you'll be hated and rejected because of me. But rather than striking back, rather than attacking back and hating back, you're to turn the other cheek. Rather than overcoming the world with strength, I want to go and overcome the world with weakness, with vulnerability. The wolves will attack you, but you are to be a lamb. And this reveals to us the nature of the gospel, I believe. Think about this. Have you ever been attacked, you know, or accused of something, you know, or judged for something you did? It doesn't feel good. It feels really bad. Terrible, actually. And our reaction, whether the accusation is warranted or not, is typically the same thing. Our initial reaction, our most natural response, is to push back and defend ourselves, right? We want to try to justify our position or our behavior, our actions. That is a natural response. It's ingrained in each of us. And Jesus is telling us that is not the way you are to behave now with others. That is not the way you will interact with the world. To accept Jesus' message, his gospel, is to give up our rights to push back and defend ourselves. Right? We are no longer to relate to people that way. And the Bible tells us this behavior, you know, this instinct to push back, defend ourselves, justify ourselves, is innate, right? It's ingrained in us from the very beginning. Think about Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, right? They're confronted by God in the Garden of Eden. After they eat the tree, you know, after they eat the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what happens? What do they do? The first thing they do is they go and hide. And that doesn't work, right? And God confronts them. And what happens? What does Adam do? Adam blames Eve. This woman you gave me made me do this. And then what does Eve do? She blames the serpent. The serpent lied to me. That's from the very beginning laid down in the Bible. So naturally, we are incapable of facing the reality of our lives. Why? Why is that so hard for us to do? Because it's terrifying. It's terrifying to do that. Especially when we mess up. We are deeply aware that on some level, deep within us, we are not what we should be. And we are suspicious that all is not well inside of us. There is a hypocrisy in us that we can't quite get away from. And so we tend to hide our faults. We tend to justify ourselves. But the gospel offers another way. It offers us an alternative to that natural response. So, imagine this. Eventually there will come a time <clears throat> when we will have to all face kind of the reality that we've fallen short in some way. That just will happen. All the time it will happen. Every once in a while you go through, we'll go through cycles and in some way we'll fall short and we'll have to face it. And we'll not fall short in some, you know, other person's ideas of what is right and wrong. You know, it's not like someone else's standard for us, we don't measure up to their standard. No. We will fall short of our own standards. We will fall short of the expectations that we have for other people. We will not even be able to meet that. So not some foreign concept of morality, just our own kind of internal clock. The way things should be, we're not going to measure up and we're going to realize it. And then when that time comes, we'll have a couple options, two options. The first option is what the natural response is and what most people do. We'll allow the pressure of perfection and the fear of failure to drive us to rationalize our own behavior in an attempt to justify ourselves to other people and to our own sense of right and wrong. That's option number one. That's the automatic default option we go to. And the other option is to embrace the gospel, which means we abandon those efforts entirely. We face the truth of our lives, and we trust ourselves to Jesus. We trust Jesus with the reality of our lives. And if you think about that, that's actually freedom, right? Isn't it? Because to justify ourselves to other people and to, to justify ourselves to ourselves is a full-time job, right? It's a full-time job. So the gospel is offering us freedom, freedom from posturing, from bending the truth just a little bit to cast ourselves in a more favorable light, right? Free from worrying about what other people think about us. 
freedom from fear of what other people will do to us, what they'll think when they find out really that we're not that good, you know? The gospel offers us a way to face the truth of our lives, even when it's ugly, without fear. We're free from the pressure to justify ourselves to a world, which is a futile attempt. It's a futile pursuit, and it empties us. It drains us of energy to do that all the time. So what happens when we do this? What happens if we embrace the gospel and we decide this is how we want to live? I want to do that. I want to abandon it. I understand it's a vain attempt. It's not going to work. I can't do it anymore. It's exhausting. I'll embrace the gospel. Well, look what Jesus says to his disciples once they return. Once he sends them out and they return. In verse 19 he says, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy, and you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you. That's what he promises them. Nothing will injure you. Now, there are people, and we have some fun with this, <laughs> there are people who you know, believe that quite literally. You know, they take it very literally. And I believe you can do that. You can take this verse literally because, you know, we see in Acts 28, Paul is bitten by a snake. You know, it attaches itself to his hand and he, do- he doesn't die, right? He just flicks it off and he doesn't die. And the people, is a viper, I, I, from what I can understand, and the people were so impressed that he didn't die from this snake bite that they thought he was a god. At first they thought he was a murderer because like, oh, the snake got him, you know, karma. Uh, but he didn't die. They're like, oh, you must be a god. You know, so, obviously, they were impressed. It was miraculous that he didn't die. So, I do think you can take this verse literally. Um, but also, you know, not long ago, I saw in the news that, you know, there are these snake handling preachers uh, out there, and um, someone who was snake handling was bitten by a snake and died. You know, I'm not sure what they were expecting would happen, but obviously, it didn't, you know, he was not, uh, he was injured, and he he died. So, the point is that the promise of this verse is much more interesting than snakes and scorpions, right? It's much more than just snakes and scorpions. It is that, but it's not just that, right? Jesus is promising us that if we are willing to go out into a world in, in, into the world in a state of vulnerability, he will protect us if we trust him. If we don't go out there with this idea that we have to defend ourselves, you know, from the world, we have to, you know, show that we're right. If we go out into the world in weakness, he'll be our strength. We're vulnerable, he'll protect us. If we're willing to put ourselves in danger for his sake, he will keep us safe. That's a powerful promise. That's an amazing promise. It's very all-encompassing. Jesus is telling us that when we give up trying to defend ourselves, he'll become our defender. He'll take up our case for us. In verse 20, he says, Rejoice, because your names are registered as citizens of heaven. And to embrace the gospel is to become citizens of the kingdom of God, which means we operate under the king's authority, and he extends us his protection. That's a powerful promise, and it goes right along with Jesus' declaration that he is sending us out as lambs among wolves, because that's the nature of his kingdom. So right after this, all these stories in this chapter kind of relate, right? Uh, it's kind of fun. It's like the last chapter is the same thing. All the stories related to each other. This chapter is the same thing. These stories all relate to each other. They're all in the same kind of line of thought. So right after this, what happens? Luke records this interaction that Jesus has with an expert in religious law. And he asks Jesus, he goes to him and asks him, what must I do to receive eternal life? What do I have to do to get eternal life? And then Jesus turns it around and asks him, well, what does the law of Moses say? And he says, You know, good answer, a really good answer. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength and all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. That's the law of Moses. That's the Ten Commandments summed up. And Jesus says, right, do this and you will live. And look what happens right away. Look what happens next. This is so interesting and so revealing, right? In the New Living Translation, and actually in this translation too, it reads, the man wanted to justify his actions... So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? The man wanted to justify his actions. Immediately, the man tries to defend himself, right? He gives the answer. Jesus says, that's a good answer. And the man's like, um, by the way, can I have a little bit of clarification on what a neighbor is exactly? Right? He's trying to justify himself, prove that he really has lived up to this standard. Or, you know, as much as can be expected, really... You know, how perfect can you be in loving God with all your strength? You know, does all your strength mean like, you know, all your strength? You know, he's trying to justify himself. He's trying to find a little, you know, get a little slack. Why does he do that? Why does he respond this way immediately? 
because he realizes that he has not lived up to the standard. You know, he sees that. He really hasn't. There's this suspicion in him, this doubt that, you know, I think I probably have not quite done that right. But, you know, I've done a pretty good job, right? But he realizes not love God with all his heart, soul, strength, and mind, certainly. There's an insecurity in him. There's this terrifying realization just under the surface that maybe he's fallen short. And his reaction is our reaction. Our nature is to make excuses for our behavior. Make excuses for ourselves. Cut ourselves a little bit of slack, right? I mean, that's the best I could do under the circumstances. I may not have been the perfect friend, but you know what? I, I might have exaggerated a little bit, but, you know, <laughs> I say those kind of things all the time. It's a natural reaction. We do it without thinking. Okay, so I'm going to give you this example. I, I hate to use this example because this is a terrible movie, but I'm going to use it anyway because I just watched it. There's this movie called The Family. Uh, it's so bad. I, I hope you forget the name of it. <laughs> but Robert De Niro's in it, and uh, it's on Netflix, and we didn't even watch the whole thing. It was so terrible. But it's um, a movie about Robert De Niro who plays an ex-mobster. He's a mobster, you know, for a while, as he always is in movies. And... Um, he was a mobster in this movie, and he's in witness protection. He's an ex-mobster, and he's writing his memoirs, right? He's writing his memoirs on a typewriter. And he starts his memoirs off with this top ten list of the reasons why he's actually a good guy. He starts his memoirs this way. So he's giving this list, and it's hilarious, you know, because it's so absurd. You know, he's saying things like, he's thorough. <laughs> you know, he keeps his promises. He's, uh, he doesn't do anything to anyone who didn't have it coming anyway. You know, things like this. All the while he's like murdering people, you know. It's terrifying and in its absurdity, you know, funny in its ridiculousness. But the point is this is what we all kind of resort to, right? He can't, we can't face the truth about ourselves easily, so we resort to self-justification, you know, justifying our behavior. So how does Jesus respond to this man who does this? How does he respond to this man who tries to defend himself, justify himself, you know, he tells a parable. He tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. And in this parable, the Samaritan stops and helps the Jewish man who's wounded. And we know, just based on history, the Samaritans and Jews did not get along. They're enemies. Um, in all likelihood, they hated each other. And with the Samaritan shows compassion. He stops this man. So what does this say to us? What does this parable say to us? See, Jesus doesn't let this man off the hook. He tries to justify himself, and he's really looking for a little slack. You know, give me a little credit here. I did pretty good. But Jesus doesn't let him off the hook. He doesn't cut him any slack at all. In fact, he raises the bar. The man asks him who his neighbor is, and he says, your neighbor is the person you hate the most. The person you can't love. That's your neighbor. That's the one you have to love. He says, everyone is your neighbor, especially those who hate you, especially those you hate. So by saying this, he raised the standard even higher than it was in the culture before. Their understanding of who your neighbor was they was a here, and Jesus, Jesus raised it. And he does this all the time. Throughout the gospel, Jesus does this. He goes around and he raises the standard, right? He said, you have heard it said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery. And you have heard it said, do not murder. But I say, if you hate your brother, you've already murdered him in your heart. You're guilty of murder. Jesus has, is raising the standard. He does this throughout the gospels. It's very interesting. He's showing that what the law requires is perfection, right? Nothing short of perfection. Perfection in thought, action, motive, deed. And we all fall short of that standard. And Jesus is doing this. He's revealing the nature of the gospel to us. Right? It's not that Jesus' standard is lower than what it used to be. Like, you know, kind of Old Testament, it was bars pretty high and things were pretty serious. But now, you know, Jesus is here and he's cutting us some slack. Right? Like, we can just take it a little bit easier because Jesus is around. Right? Now we can finally do it, right? Like, it was, the bar was too high, but Jesus is here. Now the bar's a little bit lower, and we can finally actually make it work, right? No, that's not, that's not the gospel. The standard is actually much higher. That's the only way you can make sense of what Jesus says. The standard is actually higher. It's worse than you thought, actually. That the fear we have inside of us that we're not good, the attempts we make to justify ourselves, that's a reflection of a deep spiritual reality. And you think about it, this kind of realization, right, when we talk about all this, all this should crush us, right? It should crush us under that weight. That is a heavy weight. Jesus says, you know, you thought you didn't have to commit adultery. No, it's actually much worse than that. You thought you just didn't have to murder that guy. Well, no, you can't even hate him now. You've already murdered him in your heart. Jesus exposes us, right? He's exposed us by saying these things. 
He's exposed us and our efforts to justify ourselves. And that should crush us. But look what happens right after Jesus tells this story. Right after he tells this story, Luke records that Jesus continues on his way to Jerusalem. As he continued on his way to Jerusalem. Jesus tells us the standard is perfection, right? That your attempts to justify yourself and your failures is not enough. It's not good enough. But then he heads towards Jerusalem. And why is he going to Jerusalem? To die. To die in our place. See, the weight of this doesn't crush us. It crushes him. That's why he goes to Jerusalem, right after he tells this story. That's why he can put this out there. Because he knows, no, the standard is too high, but I will bear it. Jesus sends it out, us out as lambs because he's the ultimate lamb. He's the lamb of God. In Jerusalem, when he goes and he stands before his accusers and he's accused of all these things and they're lying about him, he remains silent. He doesn't defend himself. He who has every right to defend himself, every possible justification to defend himself, every ability to defend himself, he could pick the perfect word, get off the hook, he chooses to remain silent. He was silent in his own defense. Why? So that he could speak for us when we're accused. So that he could defend us instead. He didn't defend himself so he could defend us. So what's left? Well, look how the chapter ends. I told you every story was related. On the way to Jerusalem, they stop in Bethany and they visit Mary and Martha. We're introduced to them here. Mary and Martha are sisters. Um, they're, Lazarus is their brother. Jesus raised him from the dead later. And they're very close to Jesus. They have a very close relationship with Jesus. And you can tell the way Jesus speaks to, to Martha and Mary that he cares for them. You know, he answers to Martha. He says, Martha, Martha. Or, you know, the translation, my dear Martha. You know, it's a sign of just compassion, the way he speaks to her. So we come to Mary and Martha. Martha is busy preparing this dinner. She's upset with her sister, just sitting at Jesus' feet. She's overwhelmed with these burdens. She complains to Jesus, tell her to come and help me. And what does he say? He says, there's only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and I won't take it away from her. And that's what Jesus says to us. You know, the mountain's too high. The mountain is too high. The standard is too high. It's insurmountable. But I have made a way for you to be accepted. Not based on your efforts, but based on what I have done. And now, put away the posturing. Put away the self-justification. The temptation to defend yourself. Put that all away. And there's only one thing left for you to do, and that's to sit at my feet and listen to me. You see, loving the, our enemies like the Good Samaritan does is not possible without the gospel. Defending ourselves is a full-time job. But if we are willing to trade that in, trade that in, give up our rights to push back and defend ourselves, we get the gospel, and it frees us, and it frees us with purpose. Now we don't have to worry about ourselves. We don't have to worry what people think about ourselves, or that we don't have to worry about impressing God or impressing other people. God promises to take care of us. We don't have to worry about justifying ourselves because Jesus justifies us. So now we are free to simply care for other people without pride or ego, e ego or guilt or insecurity or any of those things that trap us in selfishness. So Jesus sends us out into the world as lambs among wolves. And we trust God to defend ourselves, to defend us, to justify us. We don't demand fair treatment. We don't demand our rights. We don't demand recognition. We abandon ourselves to God fully, trusting what Jesus has done. And in turn, we experience this radical freedom that enables us to serve others, even our enemies, with great joy. It's a wonderful promise. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for this chapter, for what you've done for us, God. We know that you send us out as lambs among wolves. God, that you tell us that we don't have to defend ourselves to pick up our case, that you'll do that for us. We trust you to defend us, God. We trust you to justify us because we know that we can't do it. So we put down our rights, we put down our ego, we put down our fear and all our running around, worrying about what people think of us, worrying about justifying ourselves to the world, proving that we're good. We put all that down, Lord, and we just trust what you've done. We trust your good work on the cross in Jerusalem on our behalf. We trust you to care for us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.